So thank you to everyone for coming today. Um, I'm Lauren, one of the three coordinators of Neurocom Affinity Group, along with Zoe and Yuki. Um, and today's talk will be our very first on science education. Um, so we're thrilled to have John Kovach as our guest. He is the director of UCLA Science Project at UCLA Center X. Um, John graduated from Texas A&M University with a BS in biology before receiving his teaching credentials from UCLA. Um, he has since been working in education in Los Angeles for the past 20 years in various capacities, including as a classroom teacher, a department chair, instructional coach, and a professional development creator and facilitator in science education. Um, in his current post as the director of UCLA Science Project, John supports science instruction in over 15 school districts in LA County by implementation of next generation science standards. John also serves as a teaching associate for Thinking Collaborative for Adaptive Schools seminars, where he helps members develop their capacity as collaborators, inquirers, and leaders. Additionally, he's currently on the steering committee to organize the annual Lead Learn meeting, which is an annual gathering that brings together staff and K through 12 educators of the California Subject Matter Projects to initiate and develop efforts for advancing student learning and literacy. Um, so as you can see, Director Kovach has experience in many aspects of science education, and we're so happy to welcome him here with us today. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for having me today. Um, before uh, we get started today, um, I'm gonna like to acknowledge uh, that I'm on the traditional territory of the Tongva, uh, the original people of Los Angeles. Uh, if you do not know, uh, Tongva had around 100 villages in Los Angeles and around 5,000 people. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more in the chat, I'm going to put right now um, a link to a, a great kind of, let's call it an article uh, about the traditional people of Los Angeles, if you'd like to learn a little bit more. So thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I hope you all are staying well, I'm taking advantage of this uh, beautiful Los Angeles weather, which is uh, why I think I pay the mortgage, right, to be able to sit outside in November and talk to you all today. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen and uh, get started. And I have a sh short, brief presentation to talk a little bit about the who we are and the work that we do, and uh, how we're uh, our our team is approaching science education uh, today. <laughs> Let's see here, let me share screen first. Sorry, I normally, I feel like I, I hit that point in my age where unfortunately my technology skills are decreasing at this point. Normally I have somebody uh, uh, handle all this for me, but I'll, I apologize in my slowness. All right. So hopefully all, give me a second here. So again, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be here. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is just uh, how teaching science uh, to students is a little bit different, probably how I learned science and how you learned, uh, how you went through your science education. Uh, there's been some really drastic shifts in the past three to five years in science education about how students go about uh, figuring things out. And so today we're gonna uh, explore that and kind of give you the why, behind why things have changed and also to talk a little about how we do it. And then there'll be time for questions at the end. So usually how I start with, uh, with any group that I do, uh, that we, uh, that whether it's teachers or whether it's My students, Chase, we always California, start with uh, gonna... a phenomenon. And as you watch this, all I want you to do is, what are some things you notice and what are some things you wonder? You can go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, hopefully you all can hear. If you can hear what's going on. Okay, yeah, so in the chat, what are some things you notice and what are some things you wonder? Mom, I broke it! Look it! I did! I broke a glass! I broke a glass, people! 
music video. Yeah. And again, if you can just take a few moments, what are some things you're noticing? What are some things you're wondering? And type it in the chat. I broke this wine glass by only my voice. So don't try this at home. So just a way to kind of prime the pump. You can either unmute and share, or if you want, type in the chat. What are some questions you might have that come to mind uh, with Chase? You know, one thing that always comes to my mind when I watch this video is why is he not wearing goggles, right? Uh, that's probably the, the first question that comes to my head. Lauren, thank you. I think his excitement, yeah, from using a scientific phenomenon to have a real world effect, yeah. So we're kind of getting into this idea. We'll talk about that later, about how we try to use real world phenomena uh, for students to figure out uh, how the world works and how science uh, affects, uh, how science tells us the answers, right? Uh, what are some other questions you might have after watching the video or some things that you're wondering about? And again, you can unmute share or type in the chat. How did he first figure out that he could move the straw with his voice? Yeah, so the straw, there's a reason that, that straw is moving. I'm not gonna tell you why it's moving because that wouldn't be fun, but yeah, there's a reason for that. What might be some other things you're wondering about? Did his mom know what he was doing? If so, why didn't she give him goggles? Yeah, I think every time I show that to, to anytime we show this video to teachers, that's probably the first question. Like, where are the goggles? Where are the goggles at? And gloves, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who knows? I know right now, I'll be honest, I'm wearing flip-flops, so who knows what uh, Chase is wearing there, right? So, similarly, uh, Moan, I wondered if this was something he saw on a TV show or cartoon. Yeah, so sometimes, uh, people breaking glass, their voice, or where else did he got the idea from? Yeah. So how did he know? Where did he come up with that initial idea, right? Was it something he saw? Was it something he read about? Was it something he just wanted to try out? Uh, maybe something that, you know, he got challenged to do. And that's the, how did he know to modulate his voice, Zoe? Yeah. So maybe he, maybe had, maybe he has an understanding, right, around pitch. We don't know, but maybe he does. Maybe he plays an instrument. I'm not sure. But you can see from this phenomenon, you can get a lot of questions and there's a lot of science happening with Chase and breaking this class, right? And it can lead to a lot of questions, especially most importantly questions that maybe you're coming up. Why did he decide to use a wine glass, right? The materials, right? Uh, I think uh, Mel is saying, why did he decide to use a wine glass on purpose, right? So is there a certain thing about materials that maybe he knew about? So all these questions, you know, whether they're some can be explored, some can maybe we can Google, some maybe we, can, maybe we can't answer in the classroom. But what you're seeing is by using a phenomenon that we have these questions that we want to answer to figure out and we can do, do, use science to do that. So we're going to go ahead and move on and uh, go on to the next slide here. So what we're a part of, give you a little background of what uh, the science project is. Uh, in California, there are what's called this California subject matter projects. And these are projects across the state in different subject areas. Like there's a mathematics project, there's a writing project, there's a history geography project. And of course, there's a science project and a few others. And uh, the California Science Project, we're a statewide support network for teacher professional learning and leadership development. Um, we get some of our funding from the state, we get some of our funding from the federal government. And these science projects are housed across the state at different universities and independent colleges in California. Um, we're headquartered out of UC Riverside. And uh, we really focus on the needs of, uh, well, we collaborate with science faculty, with educators and schools. And we really try to focus on providing high quality science instruction with, we really, and focus on the needs of uh, English learners, students in poverty and students below literacy. Um, now, this, our science project, we're housed in Center X, and Center X is, uh, is a place where researchers and practitioners, where we collaborate to design programs that prepare and support K-12 teachers and administrators, and we're committed to social justice. We are a social justice-oriented organization. Um, uh, our kind of mission statement, or our mission statement is, we are a community of educators working to transform public schooling to create a more just, equitable, and humane society. So anytime that I'm working with teachers or schools, or even the faculty uh, in GSEIS where, where Center X is housed, social justice is at the forefront of our work. It's not an add-on. It's not something that we consider last. It's something that it's a lens that we look through for everything that we do and the work that we do. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. So our mission 
for the science project is the goal is we're really trying to implement programs to identify and develop and uh, promote strategies that make good science instruction available and accessible to all students. Not just certain students, not students in this period, not students in one section of the school. We really work with teachers to uh, figure out the best way to facilitate science instruction that all students have access to science, right? Our goal is not to get everyone down and get everyone on a STEM career pathway, but to really help teachers, uh, what we say, help students become uh, critical consumers of information, right? To really make informed decisions that affect their communities and the, where they live. So we'll move on. Okay, not let me move on there. Minimize this. All right. So some of the school districts that we work with, um, we work with all over Los Angeles. There are multiple school districts in Los Angeles County. It's not just LA Unified. You'd be surprised how many different school districts there are. Um, but we work uh, with right now with around 15 districts. Some of our partners right now are LA Unified, uh, Alhambra, uh, El Rancho, Compton, South Whittier. And uh, we primarily work with teachers in the districts. We also work with administrators and counselors as well. Uh, one of the things that we really value in working with schools is we try to do partnerships with those schools. We really try to stay away from doing hit and run, what we call hit and run PD, which is one day professional learning. Our focus is really on developing a partnership and really helping those school districts develop their vision for science education with their students and their community. So typically our work with the school district runs for a minimum of at least a year, if not sometimes with some of our partnerships it lasts it up to five to seven years uh, working with them. Um, we also, partner, uh, you know, we're housed in, uh, in, in GSEIS in Moore Hall uh, on the garden level. And what I love working at Center X is it, the X stands for where research and practice intersects. So we get an opportunity to work with the faculty in GSIS and help them with their research and bring and bring some of that research out to the schools. And then therefore the schools inform them on their research. So it's kind of like a two way street, right? Like you can't have research without practice and you can't have practice without research. You know, you have to get into the schools and get some feedback and see what's working, and what's not working. Um, we also have the opportunity to work with uh, other departments uh, around in uh, UCLA, like the physics astronomy, uh, uh, we're doing some outreach with them, P particularly, as you know, most NSF grants, there's always that outreach component. So a lot of faculty in the sciences reach out to us to help them develop ways to bring their research to teachers. Uh, we also have a partnership with uh, uh, the California Nano Systems Institute, uh, where we help them develop uh, professional development for teachers that highlights the research they're doing in the classroom. All right. So just to give you an idea of how science instruction, what's happening with science instruction is this research and the way that students are being taught science has been happening for about 20 or 30 years now. And it all started with a book called How People Learn. Um, and these, and this, uh, this, these books you can find on National Academy's press. You can download them for free or interested. So that's kind of the base of where this all came out of how people learn. And that, kind of moved us along to a whole bunch of different other uh, uh, books that were around science education and uh, things like Ready, Set, Science, Taking Science to School, so forth and so on. You can, again, they're all on uh, National Academies Press. And that led us to about 2012, where we came up with a framework, a national framework for K-Science uh, education. And kind of the reason behind this is that we're starting to see ma these major changes in education occurring on the national level. We had Common Core and other, uh, other uh, uh, curriculum being kind of changing of what, through discoveries of how students learn. And one of the things that really caused these changes was STEM, uh, student demographics across the nation were changing rapidly. And teachers were really seeing uh, a lot of student diversity in classrooms. And there was a problem because what was happening is the achievement gaps in science and other academic indicators among demographic groups kept persisting. There was a large gap between students of color and uh, white students. So in California, 
from the, I'm sorry, to take a step back from the uh, framework of K-12 science education, we came up, something came up with called NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards. And these standards were then adopted by California and created a science framework. And the interesting thing about the California science framework, not only did they use the Next Generation Science Standards, but they also used, uh, um, they also created some environmental standards as well. Right, so let's move on. So take a moment, and this is, uh, I feel like I've been talking a lot. I never normally talk this much, but take a moment to read what the goal of NGSS is. And if you could in the chat, maybe type in, what are some things you're noticing about this goal? What are some things that maybe are popping up for you about this goal after reading it? Or if you, get, if you want, you can unmute and share. Oh, sorry, Megan. Uh, I said, just take a moment to read the quote and then what are some things you might be noticing in this or maybe what might be resonating for you uh, from this quote? <laughs> Thank you, Yuki. These skills apply broadly. Yeah, outside of STEM coursework. Correct, yeah. We're really thinking about how can science really inform uh, students' lives? Yeah, yes, like not necessarily on STEM fields, but across topics, yeah. Critical consumers of information feels really relevant, especially today, right? That uh, for understanding uh, media reports, but also consuming news, especially social media and unverified reports. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there, right? That students have to filter. And so if we're able to give them skills uh, to really think about that information and think about ways that they, they can use that information as evidence to become problem solvers in their community, right? That's what really we, uh, 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 we're really working towards. We wanna really inform students because what we know is with information comes power, right? And if our students, especially students uh, in, in certain areas of Los Angeles don't, do not have any power, whether it's because of economics, whether it's because of race, maybe it's because of gender, but if they can have access to that information and information that allows them to really think about ways to change their communities, right? To change the environment that they're living in. And Lauren, I love the phrase, evidence-based argumentation, a pet peeve of mine is when people make arguments that, with no evidence. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, right? Over the past couple of days. I should say more than the past couple of days. So this is how science looks a little bit different is it's definitely not the way that we experience science, right? Or how we were taught, um, you know, I was taught very traditional you go in, you read the book, you know, you have these labs. If you're fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough to work with faculty, you know, and help them with their research. But it was all, a lot of memorizing of facts, right? And what we found out is that is not science. So what, next generation science standards have three dimensions, right? The first one is what's called the, con, is the content or what they call disciplinary core ideas. It's what students know. Um, these core ideas have now been shrunk down, looking more at things more in depth on a K-12 progression rather than a whole bunch of ideas. There's also what's called the science and engineering practices. And these, we'll talk a little bit about the practices a little bit more. There's eight practices. And uh, these practices uh, kind of are the, the, how scientists think and what scientists do. And then finally, with the last dimension is called the cross-cutting concepts. Um, of how, ways to frame how students are thinking, right? So these cross, an example might be patterns or cause and effect. And this is what, these are lenses that go across all disciplines, these seven cross-cutting concepts uh, that allow ways to frame thinking and ways to look at different systems, right? Now, these were, the Next Generation Science Center was a great first step, but I really feel, and some others feel as well too, that these standards really felt short on science instruction, especially around the ideas of engagement, equity, and diversity, right? And what we need to understand is, is these standards were still created in dominant culture, right? And, set, and settled science. And, and really that idea of what counts as knowledge and knowing is really, 
you can see these in any standards, not just the science standards. So we really have taken some time and work to think about how can we make sure that equity is at the forefront, diversity is at the forefront, that students are engaged in their learning, and really, how do we honor what the students are bringing into the classroom? All right. So why do we want to do, why, why is it important for us to really think about our students and diversity, engagement, and equity? Well, what we know is, is 10 of the top 14 fastest growing industries require some type of STEM training, right? Computer science, uh, we think of computer science, we think of data, we think data science. Uh, there's always something kind of related to STEM. Um, now, across the country, Blatt and Latinx students are often limited or denied access to STEM courses in high school when they're not the majority. And I would even argue that those districts I work with, even where you see maybe Latinx students and black students are the majority, you still have, you still have these issues of students not being entered into science courses or advanced science courses for certain reasons, right? One of the major reasons is math, right? They're, they, they, they don't understand the math to do the science, which we can have a whole uh, uh, another talk about that. But so we really wanna think about in giving access to science for all students, all standards. So when we look at the college level, right? Latinx and student and black students and white students, the, the, the average number is around 20% that enroll in STEM majors, right? That, there's a little bit of difference. Like it's pretty much the same, but where the difference comes in out is that 37% of Latinx students and 40% of black students switch majors compared to 29% of white students within the first year, within the first year. And 20% of Latinx and 26% of black STEM majors left their institutions without earning a degree whereas only 13% of white STEM majors there. So not only on the K-12 level, there's a lot of work on the, on the collegiate level that still has to be done to ensure that we have that equity and diversity. Because what we know is, is when you cut out, when you cut out individuals, you cut out certain members of the population, you're cutting out the, some diverse and divergent thinking, right? Which we know that diverse and divergent thinking is what makes all ideas stronger. So, how do we do it? Well, this is just to quote to frame our thinking uh, a little bit for the rest of our presentation. I'll give you a chance to take a, uh, uh, to read it. And Lauren, is my screen still okay with you there? Can you still see the screen all right? I just shrunk it a little bit. Um, the left side is cut off a little bit. We don't see the first okay. word of the quote. Okay, thank you. I'll go back one. Thank you. That looks good. Okay, thank you. So again, for us, when we think about professional learning with teachers, we really focus on uh, how do we support socially and culturally relevant teaching. Um, so we're going to kind of get into the how briefly of how we do that with teachers. Um, okay, for us, what's really important is developing a STEM identity uh, with students, right? We know that we go, the, the students come in with a bunch of, with a lot of different experiences. So we wanna help them develop a STEM identity in a certain way. And one way to do that is to really think about how do we center students in the classroom? Um, this is not me that came with this quote and I cannot remember who said this, what her name is, but uh, my director, we were talking that day and she brought this up and I thought it was really relevant. Uh, so she said, who's doing the adjusting I can't remember the name lady. Who's doing the adjusting in the classroom? Who's doing the accommodating in the classroom? Is it the teacher or is it the students, right? And from what we know, the teacher is the one that has to do the accommodating, right? If we're really gonna help students develop that STEM identity uh, and, and honor who they are, we really have to accommodate who we are, our style of teaching, uh, what we feel is important, what we feel uh, uh, of uh, what counts as knowledge, right? and really nurture those students to develop that identity. Um, so how do we do that? We honor students' experiences that they bring into the classroom, right? Um, one of the things that really bothers me a little bit about COVID is this idea of learning loss, right? You hear a lot of learning loss at home. I would argue there's probably a lot of learning going on at home, right? There's a lot of families that were that learning that, that you can make connections to, to all types of learning that's happening. 
So students bring all different experiences and those experiences are important, right? To develop that identity. Um, we really need to acknowledge their racial, their gender, their culture, their spiritual identities and the communities they live, right? To, those aren't separate from that STEM identity, right? And they, and they shouldn't have to give up those uh, or assimilate into dominant STEM culture, right? They need to be, they should be able to hold on to who they are, what they are, what they believe in, and still be able to, to be a member of STEM and be, uh, and, and be able to contribute and not have to forget and not have to leave or assimilate to maybe that idea of, of you know, which we still, there is, there's a, a white dominant male culture, right, in STEM. Um, also, when we think about this, sorry. We want to really build a sustain a science community like science doesn't exist without a community without being able to uh, talk and share have success and have failure and that's something that teachers and we try to talk to teachers to do from day one. How do we really help. How do we build that community where we can argue where we can challenge where we can collaborate and work together to come up with the best ideas, the best possible solutions or the best possible ways to figure something out. And then finally, as teachers as well, even as a facilitator, I, and I was a classroom teacher for years and I taught in South LA for years. I taught in Rampart for years. I taught in middle school and high school. Love middle school students, probably like my favorite time is working with middle school students. But being a white male, I really have to think about what are my alternate biases that I have and hold on to and keep that at the forefront because they determine what actions, again, it goes back to that, what counts as knowledge. Uh, how am I, you know, am I making sure that I'm acknowledging that I'm teaching students of color, right? Are my actions or what I'm thinking, how is that affecting them? Am I allowing them to bring their experiences in? And also, too, I think positionality plays a big role in this, right? Um, that, you know, students and the teacher, there's that positionality there that we have to be aware of that sometimes affects interaction. And, you know, a colleague and I were talking the other day, even being in STEM like you are, there's another whole set of positionality that comes with being in a STEM profession that may not be in other professions as well, too. So something to think about that may help with our, that may uh, kind of, that may influence our interactions with our students. So as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, I was fortunate enough to work the past four or five years in NSF grant with one of the GSEIS faculty, and we were really looking at implementing NGSS. And what I said earlier around there were some things missing, and what I really discovered in this grant was there are some key components that really affect that 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 equitable instruction, the the engagement, the equity that we're kind of missing from NGSS. And that's what we kind of find out through our research. And there are four things here, and I wish I had a little more time to talk about these. I know I'm running up on 25 minutes, but the idea of planning for coherence, right? So instruction should be um, centered. There should be a reason for everything that you're doing, right? And the instruction should be centered around phenomena. And this phenomena uh, should connect the students lived experiences that they have, maybe have some prior knowledge around and really shift away from isolated or conformatory activities, right? Pillar two, framing clear aims. Uh, we really believe that, and research shows that uh, when the teacher makes the purpose of the learning behave and behavior and actions explicit for the students, that, that helps the students identify their role in the activity, right? So if I hand a kid a worksheet, their brain says, I just need to fill out this worksheet. But if I'm able to ask a student a question around a phenomena, then it kind of reframes what how that student approaches it, right? It goes from having to fill out a worksheet to, hey, I need to figure this out. Um, talk is very key. Uh, it allows students to think about their claims, work through their claims, uh, and uh, work through their current understanding of the concepts that may be in their approaches to the phenomena. So that really the student talk and structured talk is extremely important in science. And then finally, using those science and engineering practices to uncover the core ideas, right, in science. In other words, you're not telling students facts, right? That they're doing something like creating a model or developing a model or engaging an argument or uh, ask, even asking questions that we did at the beginning that allows them to uncover some of the core ideas in science. And so I'm going to just touch on two very briefly. One is the idea of planning for coherence. And I'll give you an opportunity to just read through this quote uh, from uh, Next Gen Science Org.
so what we know is engagement is a crucial to access and equity, right? It's an access and equity issue. Students that don't have access to the material in a way that makes sense and is relevant to them are disadvantaged, right? So they need to make sure that those connections are, are there first. Otherwise, they're not going to be engaged in the phenomenon. They're going to miss on the science. So we really try to find phenomena that are interesting and relevant and really help support uh, student engagement. And also, too, like it, it could be it builds on everyday or family experiences of where students come from. So go into this a little bit deeper, right? So most of most of science instruction now is centered around some sort of anchoring phenomena, right? Like we saw at the beginning, maybe that that chase could have been an anchoring phenomena around sound. Um, you know, even an anchoring phenomena that I changed with is just standing outside and listening. And hearing all the different noises, like if you could hear all the different sounds right now behind me, I live next to the LA River, next to the five. There's always hell. You hear, I hear helicopters, I hear birds, I hear dogs barking. And how is it that I'm able to hear all those things right from my front porch? And they go about trying to figure out that anchoring phenomena through what we call investigative phenomena. So smaller little pieces of the puzzle that allow students to ultimately figure out the sound phenomena. Um, what we know is we don't want those investigative phenomena to stand alone because without the context that it, the learning doesn't really happen. So in other words, we try to stay away from doing activities for activity's sake. And more recently, we've really been focused on what we call localizing science and really thinking about how we can provide multiple entry points for students to engage in science and that they have some experience, right? Also to think about culturally where they are, no matter what their background, they're living in the same community in the same neighborhood, uh, what's some common ground we can use? And more importantly, how do we humanize science, right? How do we allow students to engage in conversations that are social, economical, historical, or cultural lenses that science can support, right? I think sometimes we think of that as separate, but what we know is that's, an incredible, that's a critical piece to engage, in the, to engage in science when thinking about social issues, economic issues, historical issues. And really, when we have local phenomena, it really cata like, you know, it catalyzes students to becoming those change agents in their community. So when we think about that idea again of humanizing science, right? Um, we really are trying to give them opportunities to explore their communities. We're really trying to give them access to information. And I talked a little bit about that earlier, that if I have access to information, I have access to power. And that power can inform my decisions in my community to make the, the, the decisions that are right for them. And I know I'm running a little bit short on time. Oh, you have plenty of time, John, don't worry. Okay, okay, great. And, you know, so when we think about, it's, there's another piece to this in science. It's just not learning about science, it's learning how to apply science to make decisions in their community. So I'm gonna just offer an example, right? How, oops, sorry about that. How uh, we can think of local versus global, right? So this is, uh, I've seen this before on lots of websites when we think of climate change, right? And this is a model that a lot of teachers use to engage their students in climate change. Like, what do you see? What do you wonder? Just like we did with Chase, right? And, and I would argue students say are really, you know, really, they are concerned about climate change, but it's really important to see them. How is it affecting them on a global level? So one of the ways that we have engaged students around climate change is by looking at urban heat islands, especially in Los Angeles, right? And looking at how, what, why are we holding so much heat in, in Los Angeles? What are some ways of preventing it? And what are some ways of, of really thinking about how is that taking effect in our community, right? And I know earlier we talked about humanizing data a little bit. So another way to get a little bit deeper on this is to look at parks or green spaces, which are really important when we think about climate change, right? There is a whole bunch of data that you can access around parks in Los Angeles, right? So if I think about where I taught and I look them up and you, and I, it's interesting what they, what they consider parks in some of these areas around the school I taught at um, Slauson in Vermont, right? This is like 60th street in South LA. Um, there was one park that, that there was also a, uh, uh, a roundabout, a roundabout, which they considered a park. There was also a dirt lot, which they considered a park, right? So 
and so when, we, when you start talking about students, they'll say like, well, I can't go to that park because there's a lot of shady things that happen at that park, right? There's a lot of things my parents will let me go there. So we really start to think and talk about humanizing that data and think on a local level of how we can affect, you know, how we can change our area for better. Maybe that's thinking about how can we design a better green space? How can we look at maybe look at tree cover in South Los Angeles and think about how is there a way to actually increase the amount of foliage and loss in South Los Angeles? So students engage in these on a local level and it has a greater impact. And most importantly, they're thinking about their community. Um, all right. And one of the, and so going back to those four ideas, this is a really different piece to how I learned science and maybe how you uh, learn science is these science and engineering practices, right? And what we think about with these, we're, we're really trying to strengthen their competency with the practices. And we use practices instead of skills because it really stresses that engaging in inquiry, especially scientific inquiry, requires coordination of knowledge and skill simultaneously, right? So not only do you need to know how to ask questions, but you need to know why we're asking questions. Not only do you need to know how to, you know, think, use mathematical and computational thinking, there's a reason why there's a certain point that we use that, right? Um, so when we think about uh, these goals, right, or these science and engineering practices, it's really to cultivate like that habit of mind and develop their capability to engage in inquiry. For a long time, you know, when I was a classroom teacher, inquiry was really thrown around a lot, but nobody really had a good definition of what inquiry was or what science inquiry was. And so, you know, so these practices really give us some uh, 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 labels to understand what scientists and engineers do every day. But you know, there's always that tension, right? Especially with teachers, of like, should we really develop knowledge of the content, or should we? also develop knowledge and these practices as well. I would argue, you know, the latter, right? That it's really important to understand how, what scientists do and how scientists think uh, to be able to explain the world around them. So when I work, whoops. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, it's about, so I guess like this slide and the previous one. Yeah. Um, so Zoe, who's here, who's also um, part of running this group. So we just recently, um, we're working on this policy memo exactly about what you're talking about, about like green spaces and urban mm -hmm. heat islands and education and the long term health implications of that and quality of life. And so I guess there's a policy memo. So it's geared towards, you know, what can be done at, at the legislative level. But like mm -hmm. you as an educator who has an understanding of this, like, you know, if you don't want to like wait around for someone to like come in with like a policy solution, like how would you or do you have thoughts on like how you would incorporate that knowledge into um, like the educational setting to kind of like offset those effects? Yeah, I, I think you have to work directly with the community and you have to work directly with your students sometimes, you know, and make them aware because they're, if, they're, if, if they are able to gain that information and see those inequities, that's gonna have a lot of powerful effect on the policy, right? If you're giving them access to that information, but also a platform to really think about, hey, I, I maybe wanna inform my, my, uh, you know, my council member, maybe I wanna inform others about what's happening here. I think that's really powerful, right? To really think about how can I work with students to really, and also work on the policy, but most importantly, how can I inform students about what's happening to allow them to make decisions, right? Yeah, I really appreciate that insight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for the question. And we'll have time for some more questions at the end as well. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when we think about these practices, they're not traditionally like how I experienced or maybe you experienced. Uh, and the teachers I work with, definitely, the, the, whether it's mostly through lecture and note taking, right? And so a lot of times, uh, teachers don't have that context of what a scientist is or what this does. And that really uh, results in a lack of equity, right? Um, and, and so we wanna make sure that students have a privilege to experience science in the day to day, right? And have personal connections with it. Um, we really wanna make sure that students develop that ownership of learning and grow and, and really cultivate that identity as a, that STEM identity and in their interest and efficacy as a scientist. And so ending up, I, I know I've talked a lot and uh, you know, what we noticed is when COVID kind of happened, that science stopped happening in the classroom, especially at the elementary level. And elementary teachers are key because this is all built on a K-12 progression, right? St students go deeper and deeper and deeper. So uh, 
into one, you know, into one concept. They see it again over time, right? They see it again over time. So we really have been trying to support teachers with kind of lightening their load and thinking about what's important right now that students can engage in science at home. Because I would argue that, you know, I, I, I mean, even sitting out here in my backyard, I, 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 questions always pop into my head or things I'm always trying to figure out how things are working here. So we've come up with a way to kind of help support teachers when thinking about how to support students at home with science. And we call it sense making at home. And so what we, we've been doing is really helping teachers think about what's the big idea at the center of their work, right? So in this case, like we, I know we mentioned sound and we sound is definitely something like this big idea of how things interact at a distance, right? That's really the big idea we're talking about and sound is there. So we can explore waves, we can explore frequent, you know, uh, just thinking about uh, frequency. We can explore a lot about sound at home. We really feel it's important to allow students for choice in their sense-making process. So giving them all different opportunities to come to the same end. We really think about leveraging differences to support uh, student learning. So a lot of times teachers in science want their students to be doing all using all the same material, all the same thing to reach the same income outcome. And we know that that's not how science works. So how can we really think about the students' differences and how can we leverage that to support sense-making? And most importantly, going back to this uh, science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts, those are things that we can do at home. We can ask questions at home. We can think mathematical, mathematically at home. We can develop models at home, right? We can argue, we can communicate information at home. So all those things can be done to uncover, to help support students learning science uh, at home. And, uh, and what we've done is we've created a lot of open source materials on our website that teachers can just download and use. Uh, around different topics to explore, uh, to make sure that science is still being taught, that it's not just English and math. So I think that's it. Yep. And that is my email. And I know Lawrence said we'll have time for questions. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to email me afterwards, or if you need outreach around something or, or, or anything around science education, I'm more than happy to uh, support your thinking. Thank you so much, John. I have a lot of questions and I'm sure everyone else does too. Um, so I'll, I'll start us off. Um, one thing I'm really curious about is you mentioned that teachers often don't have a great conception of what a scientist is or what it means to do science and that that kind of contributes to the problem that you see in science education where they emphasize memorization over actually critically thinking. So I'm curious, um, in your experience, what is the typical conception of a scientist for the average teacher? That, um, I would probably say that you spend all your time in the lab. So when I work with teachers, what they really want to do is, first of all, let me say this. Any, a lot of times we bring in graduate students to talk to teachers or even some of the scientists in CSNI or faculty when they have time to talk about what they do. And, but a lot of, and you know, sometimes we organize field trips, but they always want to go to the lab. They always want to spend time in the lab. What do you do in the lab? And a lot of times they, they don't understand that there's a lot of thinking that happens outside the lab that's probably a little bit more important, right? That where you're processing that information, where you're sharing that information with other colleagues, where you're reading about other, uh, what, what other colleagues are doing, right? So I, I think that's kind of that conception that you, you know, that, 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 that we're all either always planning and carrying out investigations and what we know is there's a lot more to it than that right so i think with us what we try to do when we support teachers is we lead them through what we call adult learning experiences which they can lead their students through uh, which we call basically they're called storylines that are centered around a phenomena so they get a chance to actually go through those storylines as an adult learner and really feel what does it mean like to ask a question or what does it mean to uh, engage in argument with evidence? What does it mean to develop a, a model, right? And they actually develop models. So they get to start feeling it, start to really see what scientists do and then they can bring that back to their kids. So we really, that's not every teacher, but the majority, especially elementary, I think it's something like, I think it's less than 4% of elementary teachers actually have a science degree. So on the elementary level, it's really important to engage teachers as much as, you know, in those science and engineering practices to help them understand the work that you do to ultimately help their, their students develop that STEM identity. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds really, like really important work that you guys are doing. Are there any other questions? If not, I have more.
Okay, um, so another question that I had was, um, so a big focus of your talk was focused on diversity and um, using diversity as an asset to education um, and therefore increasing equity among your students. So um, how does the UCLA, UCLA Science Project and the larger California subject matter projects um, assess whether these programs are actually working and meeting those goals? Yeah, um, you know, we're held accountable by the state to, uh, uh, to report, you know, what we're doing and the amount of teachers that we're accessing and reaching and then what students we're reaching in the community as well too. So we have quarterly reports that we have to fill out that require us to say, hey, here's the communities that we're going into. Here's the school districts we're working with. Here's the populations that we're working with, you know? I think there is one kind of drawback is like w w with, my, with our type of work is, you know, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our evaluations are self-reported, which is always kind of, you know, you know, you can take that with, you know, what it is. I think that's an area kind of us that we can kind of grow a little bit more uh, with using some outside observers to come in and really look at our programs a little bit more closely to see if we're actually reaching those goals. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I feel that's an area that, that, you know, hopefully now that, you know, as we, we know our world has changed and that maybe we can start collecting a little bit more hard data around that. I have a question. Um, I mean, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit. I was wondering if in all your experience, you find that there is certain areas of STEM that are more effective in engaging um, students, like not, not necessarily students who already have a, have a big interest in, in STEM, because um, that's obviously like there's a wide range of topics, but but maybe people who aren't that interested, but after seem to have kind of sparked something, if there's like one area that you feel like has been more successful. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily know. I mean, we all have our own interests, right? We all have our own ideas of where we want to go. I think what the important piece about that is, it's not so much like the area of STEM, but what is STEM used for in, in, in their lives, right? And I think that's the connection that you really have to make, especially with students today, is why is it important to, to know about science? Why is it important to know about mathematics? Why is it important to know about engineering, right? When we think about maybe how we went to school, the school was just, hey, do this, figure this out. We're going to learn about the cell because it's a cell and blah, 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 right? But, but when we think about, hey, in my community, why do I have such a high rate of cancer in this particular area of my community, right? Or why is there a high rate of diabetes just in my community right here and not this, uh, these other communities in Los Angeles? That, that's where you really start to see students becoming interested in science, right? Where there's a, a purpose to what they're learning, right? Um, what was his name? It, it's I'm trying to think with the uh, uh, the idea of like, you know, I was a just because learner, right? Well, why do I have to learn these math, these math, these math uh, multiplication tables? Uh, because you just because, right? Why don't you know the 50 states just because? And now we know that information, it happens immediately, right? If I ask a student, what's the capital of California? Oh, here it is, right? So now it's a really about helping students understand the why, right? The why behind what, why science is important, why math is important, why STEM is important. And, I, and once you're able to communicate with them and then allow them to actually do that, to figure something out or to solve a problem, it really has a powerful impact. And I think it'll lead students to maybe an area where they might be a little bit more interested. Because if you think about it, most of the students in elementary, their career path doesn't exist yet. <laughs> It's, it's being invented in real time. So I think it's important to have those foundation, really strong foundational pieces in math, science, and engineering that will allow them to really be successful in school later on. That's really helpful, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question and I might rumble it a little, but um, when you were talking about diversity, I was thinking about um, as science educators or like, imagining myself again as a science student, I think um, one of the important things um, for me was to see role models. Yeah. And I think for, in a lot of cases that matters a lot to be able to have a role model or like the lack of it and um, being able to imagine a career in science versus not, I think it's like, it's very important in um, someone's life. And um, 
how do you think um, science educators can support students in that way? And like, as um, students who care about science education, how can we be a resource to those who are younger in that way? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, research totally backs what you're saying, right? There's been a, a there's, I think there was some, I read something earlier this week around how if like, uh, that uh, black communities have, a, if they have opportunities to see a black doctor, that there's a greater chance of them going to actually see the doctor, right? And it's the same in the classroom, right? If, if students are able to see themselves up there, then that, that allows them to, uh, allows them to maybe uh, think about that they that they can you know that they, they can get into that into that uh, that field and I think there's a couple ways you know like one myself being a white male it was really important for me to have to know who I was and working with students of color and really giving them opportunities to really again honor their experiences give them time to talk give them time to think about their connections and, and did I make mistakes sure and I think that's the most important piece for me is being a white male work navigating in Los Angeles and in education where I am the minority that I have to be okay with making mistakes and not being afraid to make mistakes when working with students and teachers and being able to own that. I think, it, I think what's really important too on the university level is I think you have to provide space, right? For, for students of color, for Latinx community, especially in the STEM community that allows them to gather together to talk about what they are, who you know, who they are, what they, who the, what they're going through at the university level, right? And and I'm not sure, uh, you know, how UCLA or other universities are doing that. But what we know, my, my hunch is, is that when we think about that dropout rate. It's probably because there's not there isn't space provided for these for these groups to have to talk about what they're encountering and to really think about problem solving with their account at the university. That, that I think that that might be one way to really think about, like to really support, you know, so people that are interested in science education, that are scientists to, to go maybe back into the classroom to maybe think about how to support students of color or unrepresented populations in STEM. Um, so I think something, simply offering space is one way at the university level, I think that can be accomplished. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. I have one more question. Um, are there any opportunities with UCLA Science Project for grad students to get involved in education outreach? You know, we, you know, the, typically we've worked with certain groups, but that's a great question. You know, we've some of the work that we've done has been with, um, uh, you know, like CSNI or other organizations that we've had. Uh, we we've had contact with but i'm always open to working with anybody if i have you know if we have the time and it's interesting so i'm currently working with some grad students at the biomedic me, biomedical engineering um, um uh, uh i can't remember exactly they're doing some really cool stuff around zebrafish and so um and around pollution in los angeles so we've been trying to develop storylines there's that we can take to high school to create some open source material that would be great. I think the main thing is for us too is is we love working with faculty that is that to really think about how can we take the science and get it into the classroom, right? Or or maybe not exactly the science, but maybe a piece of it. So to give you an example, uh, someone uh, gentleman from the quantum computing reached out to me, and you know his first thing was was, you know, I've been doing this my whole life and this is really hard to understand. And this is like really difficult. I'm not sure how this would look in a kindergarten classroom or even a 12th grade classroom. But the, the interesting thing though is they really understand modeling. And one of the weaknesses I think with in science right now, I see the classroom is using predictive models. Like we're able to model to explain phenomena pretty well. It's pretty easy, but a lot of times we don't see teachers helping students develop predictive models. So we've been kind of working with them the ways of creating something of how can we help teachers use predictive models in the classroom or how can we create a unit or you know, a storyline to really think about that. So we're always open to collaborating with, and, and usually we're pretty good about finding ways to say, oh, okay, we can connect this or this whole piece or what you're talking about here. We can definitely, we can definitely figure out a way to, to either, you know, to really connect what you're doing and make a connection for students. So yes, and a long answer, yes. Great, thank you so much.
Uh, we do have one minute left before the hour. So um, this is the last call for questions, I guess, before we wrap up for today. All right, well, thank you so much for, um, for coming to speak to us today, John. I think that was really educational for everyone. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, if you have any questions or if you ever want to uh, think about maybe getting some of your work into students' hands on, on the uh, K-12 level, uh, we're always more than happy to talk about that and hopefully make a connection. I, I just appreciate being able to talk to you all today and share some thinking and some ideas. And, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. All right, you all have a great uh, uh, holiday. And, uh, you too. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, stay safe. everyone. Go wash your hands. <laughs>